Well, happy Mother's Day a third or fourth time, but I think if you're a mom, you should deserve another round of applause. So thank you to moms. And also, I believe that there are many people that have experienced an adoptive mom or a second mom. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it was a friend's mom. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a coach. Whoever that might be. Thank you to all the women out there who have stepped in and loved as a mom. We celebrate you today too, so uh, thank you so much for being awesome. We are continuing in our Fresh Wind series about Holy Spirit, and today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, so go ahead and turn there in your text. If you've got your Bible, if you don't, we got you covered with two massive ones on the screens. Uh, most Most Mother's Days... Uh, we, we talk about moms, but as we dive into spiritual gifts and the spiritual gifts listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I think that the three spiritual gifts that we're going to be discussing today couldn't align more perfect with mothers, and we're going to be talking about the discerning gifts. Now, I don't know about your mama, but my mom is able to discern things like nobody's business. Like character, boom, she knows like snake or a dove, you know? Like there's times growing up where I didn't even have to fess up, mama just knew, right? Moms just have this knack of knowing things. I remember one time I was at my friend Ben's house growing, uh, playing growing up, I was probably 10 years old and we were playing soccer in the basement. Now. Keep in mind, you know, recessed lighting wasn't a big thing back in the day. And so we're playing soccer and we kick a ball and this light bulb just explodes, right? And I'm thinking, oh no, we are in trouble. So we walk upstairs and at the top of the stairs there was already a vacuum and a light bulb. And I just remember thinking, who is this woman and how did she know? Like, this is crazy, you know? Um, And while we might at times feel like moms have a discerning gift, the gifts that we're gonna be talking about this morning are more than just everyday wisdom and knowledge. These are supernatural gifts that go beyond the natural and they're given to us from Holy Spirit, the person. So let's read in our text, 1 Corinthians 12. And would you stand with me? If you're watching at home, you're in the mask on service, go ahead and stand right up. We're gonna read the word of God, starting in verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Heavenly Father, we are open to more of you. I pray this morning that you would give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive what you have for us, God. So Holy Spirit, we need you to quicken this word. We need your help to digest what you have for us. I pray that you would speak through me exactly what you want to communicate and how you want to communicate that this morning. We trust you in these things. And all God's people everywhere said, amen. Amen. You may find your seats. As you find your seat, I want you to take note that in verse seven, Paul gives the church a guideline that is important for us to remember moving forward. He says this in verse seven, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. What that means is that believers should use the spiritual gifts that are given to them in a way that serves others and reveals God's grace to them. 
Spiritual gifts given from God are always to encourage and point others towards Christ. And that has and forever will be the purpose of God gifting us these gifts. Now while I believe, and hear me church, while I believe that all of these nine gifts that are listed are available to all believers, they're universally given in the New Testament, I also believe and I recognize that Holy Spirit was at work in the Old Testament and flowing through select individuals. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, we can see the consistent character and work of Holy Spirit from Genesis chapter one, verse two, until where we're living at today. And I'll be giving examples from both the Old and New Testament where Holy Spirit gave individuals these gifts. And I'm also gonna share some stories and experiences from my own personal life. How many sound like that's a good idea? I want us to understand that the spirit of God and the nature of God has not changed and he's continuing to work as he always, just differently in the New Testament. So in doing so, I pray that we all would be open to living filled and overflowing lives of the Holy Spirit through us in a supernatural way. And I pray that as he begins to pour out, I truly believe this, as he begins to pour out more of his spirit and he begins to flow through you in a supernatural way, in these gifts, that that we would use these gifts in a way that draws us all closer to Jesus and points others to his grace and his goodness. We good with that? Let's get started. The first gift we're gonna be talking about is the message of wisdom. Turn to your neighbor and say, wisdom. And the message of wisdom, which is when Holy Spirit supernaturally imparts wisdom that could not have been discovered through natural or typical ways of learning or observing. There is a difference between wise living and receiving a message of wisdom. We should all live wisely. Wisdom, simply put, is the application of knowledge. You can be a wise liver. Not a wise liver, that kind of sounded weird and disgusting. You can live wisely, I'll put it that way, right? (laughs) All we have to do, how how do we live wise? We get in God's word, we discern God's word, we, we receive God's word, we hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him, and then we apply what we've learned. That is wise living. But how many have ever been in a situation that the Bible didn't specifically address? How many have ever uh, maybe missed a chapter in Parenting for Dummies where it's like, oh, this didn't address that, right? And we're just in need for a supernatural, more than what earth, more than what man can give us, we need wisdom in a supernatural, divine way. This is a message of wisdom. So let's take a look, Old Testament, New Testament experience for these three gifts. Take notes because this is good teaching. This is good. This is This is good, okay? In the Old Testament, we see Solomon receive what I would perceive as a message of wisdom in 1 Kings chapter three. There were two ladies that had a baby within a couple days of each other, and one of these women uh, rolled over in her sleep and accidentally killed her baby while she was sleeping. She woke up to find the dead baby. She takes the baby and swaps out her dead baby for her Uh, roommates, a live baby. And of course, when the mother wakes up and realizes this, wait, this, this, I I know we each have babies. This isn't my baby. This isn't my kid. There's a dispute breaks out. And so they go before King Solomon and they say, this woman uh, swapped out the baby. This is not my, my, or this is not, um, (laughs) I'm not baby. This is not my baby. She swapped out the babies and there's this dispute and it's like Jerry Springer of like, you know, 2000 BC, long ago, right? And Solomon, in all of his wisdom, I believe from a moment from the Holy Spirit, God gives him this. He says, bring me a sword. We're gonna chop this baby in half and there'll be no more quarreling. You can have one half and you can one half. And the real mother said, oh Lord, please do not. She can have the baby. Do not kill this baby. She can have her. While the woman who is deceitful says, sure, let him neither be yours or mine. Kill the baby and cut it in half. Now, without genetic testing, 
Solomon, in a moment of wisdom, in a message of wisdom, was able to settle this dispute and was able to, to um, figure out who this baby really was. I think in the New Testament, we see in uh, Acts chapter 6, that the Holy Spirit was giving Stephen the gift of wisdom as he spoke. In verse 10 of chapter 6, says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. How many have ever been around someone who is wise talking, right? Like they're speaking and there's an anointing on them. There is an anointing and wisdom. And, and it's just like, man, this person, there's, you can tell that this is of God, right? There's something powerful to be said of that. I think we can also see in Acts chapter 23 where Paul received wisdom when he was brought on trial before the religious council and his life was spared. There are times where our earth wisdom falls short. There are times where we need more than what we can learn. May we all be more open to more of God that he might impart on us a supernatural wisdom. I wonder if pastors operated less out of ego and more out of supernatural wisdom if church splits would cease. I wonder if in marriages, if a man and a woman would stop operating out of how they feel and how they assess things and they start asking for supernatural wisdom if divorce rates would go down. See, this message of wisdom is not reserved for pastors, leaders, deacons, elders. This message of wisdom is available to all believers. But hear me, New Hope. Unless we become full, first full of the Spirit, and then allowing God to overflow us with his Spirit, we will not receive this message of wisdom. God wants to flow in you a supernatural wisdom. Now, while I don't know that I could look back at my life and see uh, a, a message of wisdom in my own personal experience. I don't believe that this gift has been given to me yet. I believe that it could happen and maybe it has happened and I wasn't aware. I have seen this gift in effect many times. Many of you know the story of when my dad started New Hope almost 31 years ago and how in the conceptual stage of New Hope, he was fasting and he was praying. And one of his biggest fears was that the church would become about him somehow. You know, man, men and women like to elevate leaders. We like to put people on platforms. Well, I can tell you there's nothing special about me and there's nothing special about my dad. We're doing the best we can to hear God serve him and do what he asks us to do and you should do the same. And so he's seen, as he's praying about starting New Hope, he had seen too many churches rise under a pastoral leadership and when that pastor left, that church would just fall to pieces and hundreds, I see a lot of heads shaking like, yeah, we've, we've been a part of that, we've seen that. And he's thinking, God, how, how does this not become about me? I, I don't want this. And Holy Spirit imparted, I believe, a message of wisdom on my dad and he said, people clean their own houses and they have keys to their houses. If you don't want this church to be about you, then you let them clean it and you give them keys. And from day one, we have passed out keys. I'm telling you, we've probably got three to 500 keys passed out to different people. And you know the amazing thing in that? You think, well, that's crazy. Uh, don't tell our insurance guy, by the way, like, <laughs> right? But the, the amazing thing with that, we've never had theft problem. God protects it, God honors it. And from day one, because of this message of wisdom, this church was not about James Weaver, it's about the people inside it. I tell people all the time, when they try to brag on us pastors, while I believe we've got some great pastors, what makes New Hope great is the people that belong to it. It is Jesus Christ flowing through the people, through you, through the person to your left, to your right. That is what makes this church great. Now my dad didn't read in some how to plant a church book. He didn't have a mentor tell him to do that. He, he, didn't, he didn't have any form of resource. Google wasn't even around then, right? 
I don't know to this day another church that operates in this same way, but I do know that I'm thankful for a message of wisdom, and I believe if we were to look back at the last 31 years, we would see many times where this church has been guided through the wise leadership of the deacons and elders and the pastor leadership of Pastor Jeff and my dad, and I'm thankful that we can stand here today and in 31 years we've never had a split. We've never had a quarrel. That's something to be celebrated. And hear me, that doesn't happen without people being full of the spirit of God and God giving us supernatural wisdom. Because no matter how much you try, there's always a bit of flesh in everything. There's always a bit of humanity. And in doing what you think is right, unless you are so saturated with God's spirit, there will always be a tint of what serves you and your spirit and what your preference is. So Holy Spirit, help us to receive a supernatural gift of wisdom. The second gift is a message of knowledge. A message of knowledge is when Holy Spirit reveals knowledge about people, circumstances, or the future that would have been impossible to know without a supernatural revelation. Now, hear me, church. God is never going to give you a message of knowledge that is not consistent with his written word. Jehovah's Witness was not consistent with his written word, right? Right? That, that vision, that whatever, J- Joseph Smith, or I, I don't, what is it? What he said, I, I can't hear. <laughs> That's, that did not align with the scripture of God. And he is not going to reveal to you some new revelation that can't be confirmed in God's word. And in the same way, when he gives you a message of knowledge about someone or a situation or insight, it's not so that you can go and gossip Remember, the purpose in receiving this gift is to serve who? Others, and to reveal God's grace to them. How many have ever, just by a show of hands, have ever received a a message of knowledge, a word of knowledge spoken over to your life, and you'd say it was the most on point, most timely thing that you've ever, raise your hand real high and look around, right? Now put your hands down, and I, 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 I wanna, have you raise your hand if you've had someone come up to you and they spoke a message of knowledge and it was like, wow, this person is mean and whatever, and it, and it brought hurt. Raise your hand, be bold, right? Hear me in this church. The spirit of love has to be within you. That's 1 Corinthians 13. If we do all this without love, it's like clashing bangs, or uh, bangs, cymbals and, and drums, right? God is never going to give you a message of knowledge unless your heart first lays in the proper uh, posture of love because these gifts are flown through us so that God might receive glory and his grace might be revealed to edify other people. So let's take a look at the Old Testament, see how a word of knowledge was used to restore one of Israel's greatest kings. Second Samuel 11 and 12 records a time where King David looks out, he sees Bathsheba, a married woman, taking a bath. He says, go get her. He lies with her, he sleeps with her, he impregnates her, and to cover up his sin, he sins Uh, Bathsheba's husband Uriah to the front lines of battle where he was killed. Now Nathan was a prophet of God at the time and a word of knowledge came to him and revealed what David had done. And the only one who knew that, that knew what David had done was him and God and Bathsheba. And so Nathan goes and, and the Lord instructs him to confront David and it leads to David's repentance and forgiveness and unity with God. Because of God's gracious love, through a message of knowledge, Nathan was able to be a part of restoring King David. In the New Testament, we see in Acts chapter nine, where God speaks to Ananias, and he speaks to Ananias and says, there's a man named Saul, which Saul is the one who wrote 1 Corinthians in which our main text is from today. So Acts is recording about Saul. And Ananias receives this word of knowledge and says, Saul is going to be in this house on this street and he's going to be blind and you are to pray for him and restore his sight. 
Now, how on earth would Ananias ever know that if it weren't supernaturally imparted to him? Do you think that that was confirmation to Saul when Ananias walked into that house and laid hands on his eyes, that that was confirmation to Saul's experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus? I believe that that was the springboard for Saul's ministry to the Gentiles. It was confirmation of Jesus being Lord through a powerful act, gifting of a word of knowledge. God, I believe, I know, has used me in this spiritual gift several times. Uh, probably the most um, nerve-wracking or, um, yeah, I guess nerve-wracking way that he ever used me uh, to date in this was when I was in college. I was 19 or 20 years old. I'm sitting in the back part of North Central, and he begins to speak to me about this missionary lady, a middle-aged woman, maybe late 40s, early 50s, and start saying uh, she's, she's dissatisfied and she's looking for a husband. And I was like, oh no, God, you crazy. I'm not about ready to go up <laughs> and talk to this lady about whatever is going on, right? And he kept on pressing on my heart. You need to go talk to this individual. So 19, 20 years old, I, after worship, she's just kind of back there praying. And I, I walk up, I said, I have no idea who you are. You have no idea who I am. I'm just trying to be sensitive of the Holy Spirit, and so take this for what it's worth. And I begin to share with her how God saw her and how God loves her, and how he saw her desire for a husband, but how God was blessing her in her ministry, and how God still had work in her own heart to heal her and bring wholeness to her. And, and I don't remember exactly what all was shared, but she began to cry, and, and we began to talk and she gave me a hug and she says, you have no idea how much this means to me, how timely this is for me. Thank you so much. And her faith was so boosted in that moment because she knew that God had seen him. And I was so relieved in that moment that it was God speaking to me and it wasn't the Little Caesars large pizza, eight breadsticks and two liter of soda that I'd eaten the night before speaking, right? Are you open to a supernatural message from God, a message of knowledge? And are you willing to step out of your comfort zone and bring God glory as he pours out his gifts on us? And hear me, your first time operating in this gift likely won't be what I experienced with that lady. It was many, many baby steps to give me the confidence that I'm hearing God's voice. I explained this to our college students when I was a college pastor. Your ears, and your, you've got spiritual ears, and the more you respond to God's spirit, it's sort of like you're growing your antennas. You ever been out in the country and you see these massive satellite TV receivers that are just giant so that they can get it out in you know, no man's land, right? I believe that each time we respond to the Spirit prompting us, it's like our spiritual ears, our spiritual antennas, our spiritual satellites begin to grow and grow and grow. And now all of a sudden, you're walking in the grocery store. And this can and should happen through us, church. And God begins to drop a message of knowledge. Why? So that you can just know what that person is up to. So you can just know the woman at the well and the five wife or husbands that, that she's already had. So you can know all these different things. No, because it will lead to repentance. And as you share that message of knowledge, it brings glory to God. And it reveals his grace. Church, are you open to being not just filled, but overflowing with the spirit of God? Ask yourself that, really. Are, do, you, do you desire not just to be full so you can be a good person, but overflowing? These gifts shouldn't be flowing from the platform down. These gifts should be flowing between you as individuals, as brothers and sisters in Christ. These gifts should be oozing out of this place as we go into our workplace, into our schools, and into the public. How many understand what I'm saying? But that's not gonna happen until we get hungry. That's not gonna happen until God will pour out his spirit and he sees us earnestly cry. I want that for you. Tim, I was praying over here. 
I believe that God wants to use you in some bold, bold ways. And, and I believe that for everybody in here, God wants to use you in bold ways. This is not a pastoral thing. This is a Christian thing. The final gift this morning is the gift of distinguishing between spirits, which is when Holy Spirit helps us supernaturally discern between good and evil intentions, spirits, and words. This might be the most commonly needed of the three gifts, particularly in the days before Jesus' return, which I believe we're living in, when the Bible talks about the confusion and the deception that will be prevalent among false teachers and false leaders. Parents, we need to be able to distinguish spirits. I'm almost done, so lean in, take notes, this is good. Nehemiah was a prophet, and he was tasked by God to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. Why? Because walls provided Israel with security and strength. And in Nehemiah 6, verse 12, the prophet realized that Shemaiah's words and his spirit were impure and to harm and to distract him from the task that God had given him. Shemaiah was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And discerning this enabled Nehemiah to complete the task that God had given him. How many have ever struck a business deal with a man or a woman only to realize that only one of you had any character and it wasn't them? How many have ever jumped into a dating relationship and realized, oh Lord, what they presented is nothing like who they really are? How many people have been misled or sidetracked because they fell prey to false teaching or followed leaders who are not who or what they seemed to be? We need to flow in this gift. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 47, Jesus discerns Nathanael as an Israelite. He could tell that this man had no deceit. And I think that even Jesus, in Mark chapter 10, was able to discern the rich young ruler's heart where on the outside appearance, Jesus says, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Yes, I've done that since birth. And so on the outward appearance of this rich young ruler, he would appear to be spotless, but Jesus was able to discern and see the greed that gripped his heart. My in-laws are wonderful people. In fact, they get to come into town this week. I'm really excited to see them. I genuinely mean that. Some of you are jealous because your in-laws, it's like more like outlaws, right? They're wonderful, godly people. And as much as I celebrate my wife for being an amazing mom, I'm thankful that I had two parents that were pouring into her to enable her to become a great mom. My wife, Elizabeth, told me about a time growing up where her parents never felt right about her or her sisters spending the night at one of their friends' house. And they never had any proof or reason to believe that there was anything fishy or funky going on, but they just yielded to that prompting in their spirit. And they yielded to the Holy Spirit only to find out that years later, that dad was in prison on multiple accounts of molestation. I'm sure that many of you have had moments like that where, where you couldn't prove it, but something didn't settle right about another individual spirit. Are you allowing God's spirit to help you distinguish between spirits? Now lean into me right, right here, guys. Everybody look at me. Stop looking at the worship team. If I could have invisible worship team, I would totally do that, right? That'd be awesome. I know that I threw a lot of information at you today. But I hope that you realize that spiritual gifts are nothing to be afraid of or intimidated by. They are meant for and available to all of us as believers. And flowing in them is something that should be normalized within the church. Holy Spirit has been and is continuing to work and he desires to bring glory to the Father at all times. So I wanna address just a couple of lies that I believe the enemy might be sowing in your minds in this moment. The lie that I'm not spiritual enough for God 
to flow through me in this capacity. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's for pastors and leaders and elders and deacons and I'm just a regular churchgoer. Lie. I had this bad experience once and someone you know, spoke this or did that or pushed on my forehead or made me feel insignificant so I just don't believe it's real. While that's unfortunate and I'm sorry for that negative experience, that also is a lie that's being held in front of you to prevent you from experiencing everything that God wants for you, the fullness of the Spirit. This is for radical Christians. This is radical Christians. Lie, this is for Christians, Christ followers. Would you stand with me across this room? In a moment, we're gonna spend some time seeking God. We've got the time. You have got the time if you will give it back to God who's giving you the time. Here's the reality. You likely won't receive these gifts unless something changes in our hearts where we go from living as half full Christians or full Christians to overflowing Christians. So how do we get more of God? How do we go deeper? I had Jerry Clark stop me after the first um, service, Jerry and Diane Clark. And he said, you know, I found in my life that as I start my day praying for people, the Spirit of God will give me opportunities to pray with people. You know how to go deeper with God? Get up an extra 15, 20 minutes early and you spend some quiet time with God and the Word. You read the Word and you allow His Spirit to speak to you. We overcomplicate it. We mystify it. We, we think that it's just somehow like not available to us. It's, it really is. We just, we just yield. And, and I'll tell you, it's just a small tug at first. You just, what was that? What was that? Respond to that. Say, well, what if it's not the Spirit? What if it is the Spirit? What if it is? you close your eyes across this place Jesus we need you every minute every hour God we need you I pray in this moment against doubt I pray in this moment against questioning I pray that we would just set our eyes upon you, not upon past experiences, not a past, uh, upon past glories and mountaintops or past valleys and trials, God, but we set our eyes on the perfecter of our faith and we ask, God, that you would increase our capacity, that you would increase our tank, that we might become more full of you. I pray for those who have no desire right now to be in your presence. I pray that you would supernaturally give them a desire. Create in us a new heart, oh God. Create in us the ability and the hunger to thirst for things of righteousness, God. Begin to change us. Take the sin that lies with inside me and eradicate it. Pour more of your spirit in us, Jesus. We need you. We love you, God. This is about you. Break our heart for those that are lost. And fill us with your spirit and your power that we might be witnesses to them. Let's just take the next about 20 or 30 seconds 
and this might be uncomfortable for some, but I'm asking you just to step out. We're going to just pray under our breath and you begin to cry out to God what you need from him. Come on, every voice in this church, this is not weird. Jesus prayed out loud on the cross. We can do it right now. So Jesus, we just need you more of your spirit, God. Pour out your love, God. I pray that you'd make us sensitive, Jesus. Help us, God. Come on, church, press in, cry out to him. If you're not feeling it, ask for God to fix your broken feelers. If you're not feeling it, ask God to create a hunger in you. Jesus, we long and thirst for you, God. Let us taste and see that you are good, Lord. I pray that encouragement would flow today, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Help us, God. open up just the front altar here. If you need to sit down, I understand that for some people standing is a distraction because your knees hurt, you're worn out, your feet hurt. But I'm going to ask that we press in just for the next about five minutes. We've got the time. God has given us this opportunity. Let's, let's steward it. And I'm going to invite anybody who wants to come down to this altar to be prayed for to seek God, to worship, and we're just gonna create an atmosphere. So right now, Holy Spirit, fall. Fill the room, Jesus. Holy Spirit, fall. Awaken hearts, God. In Jesus' name, let's sing this song. I feel like God is just speaking. You can say and you can sing that you wanna see more of heaven, but what are you doing to usher in and invite the presence and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God into your lives? What are the things that are a part of your day-to-day -day routine that have nothing to do with God? I'm not just talking about sinful things because we could spend several weeks talking about sinful things. But I'm talking about things that occupy our hearts and take residence in our hearts that aren't necessarily bad, but they're taking priority over God. You want to see more of heaven? Do you really? You know what Sunday nights are for? You. Oh, don't go convicting me and guilt preaching me, pastor. I put in, I come to Sunday school and I come to church service. You know what Sunday nights are? It's an opportunity that after we've been in Christian fellowship on our Sabbath, the day of rest, and as we are filled in our Sunday school classes and in these churches, Sunday nights are an opportunity where that pouring just continues and it becomes an overflowing. Last Sunday night was powerful. And if you missed it, I'm sorry. But guess what? We got Sunday night this week. We got Sunday night next week. And for as long as I have breath and I'm a part of New Hope, we will always have Sunday nights because that is when we see more of heaven say, well, don't, don't preach that conviction on me, pastor. You don't understand what I'm going through. Sunday nights are family nights. Yeah, well, this, last time the Spirit of God fell over a game of Yahtzee, I'm not sure when. What's more important than getting our families in the presence of God? Would you close your eyes right now and allow the Spirit of God, every eye closed, every ha head bowed in this place, Spirit, would you begin to speak to us if there is a heart issue that lies within us where we are lying and saying, I want to see more of heaven. I want more of your spirit in my life. I pray that you'd begin to convict in this moment, not for the sake of guilt and shame, but the sake of repentance and, and, and wholeness of unity with you. So with every eye closed and head bowed, you'd say, Austin, in this moment, I realize that I am singing. I want to see more of heaven, but my actions certainly don't show it. And I need God's Holy Spirit to come inside me, place a hunger, place a thirst. If that's you, you'd just say, bold enough to raise your hand right now. I want to pray for you that God would supernaturally, yes, 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 Jesus, I pray right now that your spirit would begin to impart on people, that they would begin to fill themselves with things that are holy 
boldly, God. I pray that you would take away the flesh, the things that we desire, money and greed and, and entertainment and all of these different things, and you'd replace it with things that are holy. So God, we need you to create in us a hunger, and then we need you to fill that hunger for us, God. Help us, Jesus. Jesus, that is the cry of our hearts. Give us that desire that we would see more of heaven, that we would see and receive more messages of wisdom, of knowledge, and be able to distinguish between spirits. Bless your people as they go, everyone watching online and in the mass con service. May we live in the reality and the presence and the power of your spirit that is available to us today. We thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness that follows us and chases us down all of the days of our life. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen.